So I'm here at the Washington Report for Middle East Affairs uh, Conference, and we're at the first break, and we just heard uh, uh, an exhilarating talk uh, by Dr. Hanan Ashrawi from her home in Ramallah. And I'm here with our friend Paul Renshaw. Paul, what did you think about Hanan's talk this morning? What stands out for you well, uh, Hanan, from her talk? She, she doesn't change. She is the epitome of Palestinian Sumud. I first met her in 1991 in, in Ramallah when I took a church delegation from the UK. And uh, she was so receptive on the one hand, but challenging on the other to British church people who had a lot to think about considering the history of, of Britain and, uh, and Palestine. So uh, I was glad to see her again. She was Hanan Harashawi. Paul, you, uh, uh, you and I met just uh, within the last couple of months uh, because you've been an advocate of your friend, uh, Reverend Brian Brown, a theologian and activist, originally from South Africa, relocated to the UK, who was banned from South Africa for 13 years, I believe, mm -hmm. until the freeing of Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And his recently published book, Apartheid South Africa, Apartheid Israel. And we'll be interviewing uh, Brian in a couple of weeks. Tell us about your relationship with Brian and why this book is so important. Well, my relationship with Brian goes back uh, 40 years now. Uh, <clears throat> so I've witnessed him being a challenging figure in the British church scene, challenging both churches and government on uh, policy, uh, British policy towards South Africa during the apartheid years. But I've become aware also, because I maintain a strong personal relationship, of his uh, recognition that what's ha been happening in Israel is, to a considerable degree, mirroring that which happened in South Africa. It's not identical in every respect, but <clears throat> he felt that uh, it was important for him to draw on his South African experience theologically and write about apartheid in Israel alongside apartheid in South Africa. And, uh, and that's what he did during the lockdown in, <clears throat> in the UK in the last couple of years. So he's offering this book uh, not just as a digest of international law, but as a... Th it's a, it's a, a book of political theology. And I think that it ought to be of considerable interest to people with a theological concern for the, for the Middle East and Israel-Palestine in particular, and also I think for uh, seminary students to really come to terms with what the implications of the last, uh, well, 70 years in both South Africa and Israel have been. Um, 1948 was the year of the advent of the uh, national government in South Africa, the apartheid government, as well as the year <coughs> uh, of the, um, the Nakba and the, uh, the big change that came over the, over the land between the river and the sea. So I believe Brian has a lot to say uh, and uh, he needs to be taken seriously. What was it that brought you, uh, Paul Renshaw, to the, uh, uh, the study and activism around Palest Palestinian rights? Well, for many years I was working with the, you know, <clears throat> what was first of all the British Council of Churches and then Churches Together in Britain and Ireland, uh, the ecumenical network in Britain. And my focus for a long time being on South Africa. Uh, and uh, in late 1997, the <clears throat> some people involved with the ecumenical agency known as Christian Aid, which is like Church World Service in this country, asked me to go with them on a delegation to Israel-Palestine because they felt that my experience in relating to South Africa and in the apartheid years might have some relevance to what they were experiencing. Uh, they were reworking their policy uh, on Israel-Palestine and that was my first uh, experience uh, and it was an eye-opening time for me. All I, those trips are, aren't they? I came, I, I was then within a two or three months I was back again at the Seville conference 
and I think that was the time when Edward Said was speaking, yeah. and in Bethlehem. And it was also the time when I met an AMC, the AMC representative in Ramallah. Oh, wow. <laughs> the young white woman, I was really quite surprised. And, and, and she was saying to everybody, well, you do realize what we stood for. We stood for a non-racial one-state solution. And that was in early 1998. So there we are. Um, I had fairly continuous contact. There's been a hiatus the last decade in terms of personal visits, but I've been there seven or eight, year, uh, seven or eight times and uh, have always felt that the personality of Hanan that came through the camera all those miles from Ramallah this morning, that's the personality of Palestine that I know. Absolutely. Paul Renshaw, thank you very much. So we're here at the Washington Report for Middle East Affairs Conference uh, again this year, and the speakers have been um, amazing today. I mean, just some of the top flight uh, activists around the world in this issue. I'm just curious, uh, Janet and Jeff, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what's touched you today, what insights, uh, what's been said that has moved you during the conference so far? Yeah, thank you, Michael. You know, so much has stood out, but I think listening to Hanamishwari, at the end of her talk when she said, you know, the Palestinians are in the future. They're in the conversation that's going ahead in terms of human rights, freedom, dignity, and Israel is part of the conversation of the occupier, wanting to get rid of a people. And so the youth today are not willing to be silenced. And that hope of the future, I think, really stood out for me. Uh, I also loved, you know, what Virginia is doing. Um, that's amazing. I mean, it's these amazing. folks from Virginia, I mean, energy, curriculum, I mean, I was blown away. To be honest, Michael, I, I looked at the schedule and I thought, well, that's going to be an interesting one, but I'm not sure. And um, mm -hmm. we were blown away and uh, we're taking it right back to Colorado. In fact, we have a coalition in district, congregate, congressional district too, our house district. We call it a coalition uh, to for Palestine. Um, I'm going to go home and suggest that we make it a uh, Colorado coalition for human rights to follow after them and begin digging further just like the Virginia folks did and encouraged us to do. I was really struck when, when uh, a number of the speakers referred to the next generation as you pointed out, Janet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah amazing, amazing. In fact, we just uh, heard uh, uh, about a year ago that the largest solar energy field uh, in the country is being uh, placed by Israel in Indiana. So it's, it's an indictment of us, or it's a challenge to us to be more active and involved. Yeah, Jeff, what stood out for you so far? Well, I would say the, the Virginia, Virginia folks. piece really was. And, and the fact that um, I'm looking around the crowd today, and there's a bunch of gray hairs. Um, but I saw more younger people here. And when I say younger people, I'm talking 30s and 40s. <laughs> um, but those, those folks are going to um, take over the movement when the rest of us don't have the energy. And, uh, but I'm excited about the mix of the folks here you know, and, I, and seeing friends. I mean, goodness, this is a place we can get pretty easily discouraged in our work. We have to feed ourselves uh, spiritually and emotionally along the way. The activism has to be girded up with, with prayer and, and, and community, and this community opportunity is really helpful for me. I was in Cleveland 10, 11 years ago at the formation of the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network with Peter Makari and uh, Gay Harder and a number of those a number of those activists who are really my teachers in, in all this. Uh, you all have been very active in the Disciples uh, PIN, Disciples uh, Palestine Israel Network. I mean, very active. Uh, tell us a little bit about that work, but also this recent resolution uh, from the Disciples PIN. Good. Marla Schrader and I um, are co-coordinators for the D-PIN, mm -hmm. and um, she's the one that led me into this work. I went for a uh, sabbatical in 1998, 
And to be honest with you, about two weeks in to that uh, stay in the first time I was in Palestine and Israel, I thought we have an anti-Semitic mission co-worker that the disciples have, po that have they appointed because she was just telling me what's really happening in the place where I was. Oh, wow. and, and within the fourth week then, I had begun to see what was really happening. And Marla really led me into that work. Um, not anti-Semitic at all, just critical of the state of Palestine and what was doing to the Palestinians, uh, the state, the of, state Israel. of Israel and what was doing to the Palestinians. So she's the one that put me on this path and we've been very, very active since then. I'm really grateful to Marla for that. Regarding this uh, resolution, we had to have a COVID canceled General Assembly um, in 2021. And so um, several of us have been working with in the denomination to say we need to speak up because we're partners with the United Church of Christ. We do our overseas ministries together, Board of Global Ministries of the Christian Church Disciples and the United Church of Christ. And they've led out in this in such incredible ways. And I think we as disciples have been trying to catch up with them. And just last week, our uh, three officers of the church that are really authorized by our design, which is our, the Disciples Constitution, they issued a pastoral letter that is quite clear in his condemnation of what's happening over there. It uses the words sin and apartheid, and I've been really pleased with that letter. And we want to take it further, of course, at our next General Assembly. Many of us are working to bring a resolution where that we'll be able to speak for the entire church. This pastoral letter, though, they're authorized to speak not just to the church, but on behalf and for the church, Okay, which is which is important piece. You know, those of you who know Jeff and Janet Wright uh, on a broader scale know two things about you all. First, Jeff, you uh, write an awful lot for various publications, Mondo Ice, et cetera. But also you lead trips, uh, like I do, yeah. to Palestine and Israel. And tell us a little bit about how you got into that and just the importance of come and see, go and tell. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, we were over there doing some volunteer work and our eyes were open. And we thought, gosh, if we didn't know this, how much more, how many more people don't know it? But coming and seeing is the way you find out. It's so powerful to see it because it's right there. You can't escape what's happening, the reality. And so um, Jeff was on a seminary tour at one point and helped Again, out. Again, thanks to Marla Schrader. Did I mention Marla's name? Uh, she's a good right. friend. On that trip, we hear... Um, and this was in... This was in, oh, way back in 2008, okay. 2000, okay. whenever. That's way back. It's interesting. <laughs> um, what I would say is there's a refrain that goes with um, come and see. The Palestinians, when we're there, say, now, go and tell. Absolutely. And um, it, you have stories to tell when, when you've been there. It, it, eyes are open, hearts are open, and it's, it's really incredible. This coming June, I will be leading my 15th tour, and we're going to break the 250 participant uh, level. Very cool. uh, so Very I'm happy cool. about that. Congratulations. Yeah, well, uh, you know, we're trying to keep the faith just yep. like you. Yep. Yep. Tell us about the number of tours you've led, kind of the things you do, and about how many folks over the years have you mm -hmm. taken? Uh, 251. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a competition. I didn't, I didn't mean it to be that way. No, I'm no. sorry. No, no, you didn't. You didn't uh, I, you're I'm a dirty rat. Ready. You know that. No. I don't know. We've done 10 or 12. I think we've done 10 or 12 tours. We usually take maybe 25 people, 20 to 25. Um, we have a trip planned in November for a congregation that wants us to take them. We have a seminary trip in January. Oh, that's so important, seminary, future pastors. Exactly. Yes. That's not, exactly. I mean, I've taken some clergy. I don't think I've ever taken any seminarians. So, yeah. I mean, Phillips that's Theolo so important. Phillips Theological Seminary is a disciple seminary in Tulsa. Oh, okay. And one of their professors does an immersion course every year. And mm -hmm. two years ago, she said, we want to do Palestine. And they usually do one, you know, a different, three different ones. And she came back to us last year and said, we're going back to Palestine. So mm -hmm. we're excited about that because you're right. We need pastors and pulpits that know what's really going on. Absolutely. And she goes with us. Dr. McCallie goes with us. And she's an educator and a theologian. And, Michael, we're not in competition. The more we can <laughs> encourage each other's trips, uh, I'm excited for what you've done. And Absolutely. there's other people. You know, I think about Tree of Life. I think about oh, all the Fosna. Groups. I mean, yes. Fosna. Don Wagner. I was, we had dinner last night night here at the gala 39 trips he's led wow. over the years wow. I mean he's wow. of course my mentor my friend you know my teacher yes. yeah. so Jeff and Janet Wright Disciples Palestine Israel Network thank you very much yeah. thank you Michael thank you, Michael. Thank you for all your work oh, okay yeah, appreciate blessings
So Don, we're here at the uh, Washington Re Report for Middle East Affairs Conference here in Washington, D.C. And I'm here with uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Donald Wagner, uh, past program director at Friends of Sabeel, uh, Middle East Council of Churches, and all kinds of hats that you've worn <laughs> throughout your career, Don. Uh, and dear, dear friend, well. former Chicago Cubs fan, now Chicago <laughs> White's fan. White Sox fan. Yeah, and there's a political story there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Don, uh, it's nice to be talking to you. It's always good to see you. Yeah. Well, you too, Mike. I just think the world of what you guys are doing in Fort Wayne. I wish we could get down there more, and we'll try. Well, but, Don uh, and Linda, Don has been a mentor of mine and a dear friend for, well, for more than 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Don, uh, we're here at this conference. I mean, every Every talk has been a major oh, kind of enlightenment for the gather, uh, those of us gathered yeah. here today. Give a couple or three uh, uh, particular insights or speakers that stood out for you today. Mm. Well, we just heard from Gadon Levy, um, the great Israeli journalist from Haaretz, and he basically has said that uh, you know we need to get tougher on Zionism. We need to go hard on. Uh, issuing um, more programs that support democracy for everyone, equality, human rights, rule of law, and uh, we haven't been strong enough. Our backs have been weak. And uh, one of my old heroes from my rock and roll days, Roger Waters, <laughs> he is someone who has that strong backbone, who doesn't give in when he's attacked. Um, so we hear from people like that, Huweda, Herat, who's running up in Michigan, a, a sign of a young Palestinian now getting into politics and an activist. And so it's been one after another. And just being in the presence of these uh, prophetic people is inspiring. And for me, just to have a small role uh, to be with them, you know, it, it just lifts my spirit. And I think we need each other in this way. But also the, the hard-hitting analysis is it has just been tremendous. So I, I, I am just thankful I was here. I feel another renewed spirit, more networking and connections uh, to continue the journey. You've been about this work for 40 plus years. <laughs> yeah. And so to see the next generation yeah. at Huweda, who we've hosted in Fort Wayne mm -hmm. and others, I mean, yeah. has been, it has to be really uplifting for you. Yeah. We didn't have this, you know, maybe seven years ago, uh, with the rise of JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, young Jews who now aren't buying the old line, who are critical of Zionism, and uh, are willing to be activists, who are involved on campuses with Palestinians and Students for Justice in Palestine, and are willing to take the hits and still go strong. Uh, this is one of the most hopeful signs, I think, and uh, uh, again, inspiring. And like I said, we didn't have this, you know, until the last seven, eight years. You know, uh, Gidon Levy uh, emphasized, right, along with these human rights organizations uh, recently, apartheid, apartheid. We need yes. to keep beating that drum. But connecting his talk with your talk, you both emphasized the importance of boycott, boycott, divestment. Yes. But you both emphasized now the need for sanctions. Absolutely. Say a word about that. Yeah. Well, I think it's just learning from the South Africa experience. Uh, the boycotts are something that organizations and people do, uh, and that raises the consciousness, awareness. It puts a little bit of uh, economic support on Israel, but until governments get involved and lay sanctions, just as we're seeing with Russia in the Ukraine experience right now, uh, until that happens, Israel's not going to change. They're not paying the price. They're not being held accountable. So it has to move to sanctions. Every day I pray that it moves to sanctions. Uh, and to keep the BDS going, that, that's an absolute must. And I think the churches can play a strong role here. And we have to begin to call for sanctions. You, um, you have made so many contributions to the struggle for Palestinian justice throughout your life. But it's fair to say you've been known for your analysis and your critique of Christian Zionism. Yeah. And that's what your talk has been about today. Not only on the fundamentalist, dispensationalist right, but mm -hmm. now, later, 
okay. uh, the mainline churches, progressive churches, Roman yeah. Catholic churches. Um, uh, so talk a little bit about Christian yeah. Zionism. I know that you only have a couple of minutes to do that, but the gist of what you've been telling us yeah. today. Well, I was one of them. You know, I came out of seminary having studied the Holocaust and post-Holocaust theology where it began in World War II. And it's really a form of Christian Zionism. Uh, I call it hiding in plain sight. It's in our mainline denominations, and it's infected Congress and the Democratic Party, where you really privilege Israel uh, because you don't want to be anti-Semitic, but also it, it kind of gives an exclusive analysis of Israel, yet that we should protect it from accountability in international law. And uh, so dialogue with all the, all the uh, pro-Israel organizations is a key thing. But they tell us, check your uh, concern for Palestine at the door. Leave it to us. That's too complex. It's contentious. We shouldn't be raising that issue. Let's just have good meetings and dialogue. And this is what our friend Mark Ellis calls uh, the ecumenical deal. Forget the Palestinians. Just work on good Jewish relations. But now we've got to do the reverse. We've been weak. We've been uh, kind of kowtowed to those kinds of pressures. So now we have to stand firm for justice and hold Israel accountable on everything. And the churches now, I think, are beginning to move. The United Church of Christ had a fantastic uh, position last summer. I hope the Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists are going to do the same. And we've got to go hard on a critique of Zionism and Christian Zionism, but also uh, move to sanctions. Yeah. Really, the churches in this country are, uh, are, are responding to this cry for hope yes. from our own Palestinian sisters and yeah. brothers in yeah. Christ. Say a word about the cry for hope. And also, um, if you can make the connection, we were talking yesterday and you said you've taken 39 trips. Led. You've yeah. led 39 yeah. trips of Christians, Muslims, Jews, others from this country to come and see yeah. and then go and tell. Right. Say a word about this relationship between this country and our Palestinian friends overseas. Yeah. Well, the cry for hope uh, was they call a beyond urgent scream, cry to the global church and Muslims and Jews who will stand with them and begin to take a more assertive approach for resolutions that critique Christian Zionism, for advocacy with our legislators in every country around the world, and to move to sanctions, to continue to do BDS, so there's an activism and an advocacy component, but also to bring people, bring people to see it for themselves. I know for you and I, uh, I was changed. You know, you, you can't quite believe how awful it is until you see it. But then the hospitality of the Palestinians and their love just wins you over and they're, and they're steadfast, most of them just stay there. So these are clergy, pastors, we know them all. Mitri Rahab said, we are occupied by two forces, the Israeli military and by the Bible. And we need you, that's a Western responsibility and an Israeli responsibility. We need you to help us now survive because their numbers are dwindling. They're not gonna leave, that's a hard core. But we, you know, time is running out. So we uh, really have to elevate our activism, education, everything. One of the things that you talk about uh, um, is the need now for an intersectional mm. Western response. Yeah. It's not just about the Palestinian struggle anymore. Right. There needs to be this intersectional across various yeah. human rights struggles. Right. A quick word about yeah, that. I didn't hit that hard enough today. Intersectional just means that we need to stand with our Black Lives Matter sisters and brothers, the Latinx, uh, Asian, indigenous, indi right. yeah, indigenous, and be there for them. You know, like when George Floyd, George Floyd is killed, and when we have marches and they're calling us to stand with them against the Chicago police being trained in Israel and then brutalizing the black community. We need to stand with them and advocate for them. But they're already ready to stand with us. That's right. When Ferguson was going on a few years ago, it was interesting that the uh, 
the black folk who are out in the streets getting brutalized and taking all the tear gas hits, they were texting the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who were telling them, don't use water, get an onion. Here's how you deal with it. It's made in America, but we've been dealing with this for 30 years. Now here's what you do, and get back. Don't, don't lay down. Don't let it debilitate you. Get right back up, get your, get your onion on your mouth, and get in there again. So that's intersectionalism, solidarity, and that's where we have to go. One last question, Don, and uh, uh, don't be humble now. Don't be shy. Tell us about glory to God in the lowest. <laughs> glory to God in the lowest, yeah. your uh, uh, coming-to-be-published memoir. Yeah. Well, I hope it will be out by the end of April, and uh, thank you for the two interviews you did. That was tremendously helpful for me and helped me with some rewrites, actually. It's really my journey uh, from conservative politics that I was influenced by my dad, who was the treasurer of the Republican Party and the Goldwater Campaign in Western New York. And I inherited the debt, and I inherited Christian Zionism. And it's, this is my story coming out of that and coming out of two forms of Christian Zionism, finally getting politicized during the uh, anti-war issue, civil rights, being a pastor in a black church and learning so much about racism from them, and then discovering Palestine. And then the last 30 years of my life have been committed to that. So this is my story, and it's a call to solidarity, a call to justice with those who are suffering. And, and in the last number of years, you, you keep talking, one of, the, one of the most important things about you, Don, and one of the ways you've taught me is your continued openness to growing your analysis. Yeah. So quick, settler yeah. colonial analysis yeah. and liberation theology, yeah. please. Okay. Well, settler colonialism is uh, basically what we've done to our indigenous population, what South Africa did and what Israel's doing today. Regular colonialism, traditional colonialism, comes in and occupies, takes the resources, but eventually they're either driven out or go home. You know, like the British in India, or the British here. Settler colonialism never leaves. Yeah. They replace the people with their own settlers. This is what we've done. So we're a settler colonial regime. Israel, it's by design that Zionism replaces a land with no people for a people with no land. That's a theology and an ideology of replacement by any means, including violence and genocide. So that's settler colonialism. And what was the other one? Liberation theology. Ah. And your, your life blood. Yeah, right. So liberation theology has really been very meaningful for me. And it's really, I think, following Jesus and the Hebrew prophets and Muhammad, uh, the way of justice. And for me, it's Matthew 25. When I was thirsty, did you give me drink? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? And you might say, when I was brutalized by injustice and occupation, did you stand with me? So it's a call of solidarity to the poor and the suffering, and that's our call for Palestine. Reverend Dr. Donald Wagner, expert, uh, uh, activist, uh, author, look for his book, Glory to God in the Lowest, uh, come the end of April. Don. Thanks, thank you Mike. very much for thank a lifetime you. work of witness. Well. Perfect. So I'm here at the Washington Report for Middle East Affairs Conference in Washington, D.C. And I'm here with our friend uh, Steve France. Steve's retired, but he's a prolific writer for Mondo Weiss. Uh, he is involved with the Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. He's been associated with FOSNA. He's an activist, writer. And Steve, it's good to see you. Good to be here. Good to have you in Washington. Good. What has stood out for you so far from the conference? What has touched your heart or moved you or some insights that you've Well, received? I have to say it was last night there was the gala dinner. And, uh, you know, they have a tremendous lineup of people here uh, uh, with only one. The two so far have been remote. But so really people in the room and there was uh, everybody got up and sort of told a little bit about themselves. But all everything about it, everything they said when they came here, and the whole it's like having a family. It was like being in a big family. Everybody knew what was going on, and they trusted each other, they admired each other, and they enjoyed each other. And so that's really the spirit that is uh, 
special, I think, about it. I mean, there's a lot of great causes out there, but, but the kind of uh, situation you have when you're trying to stand up for Palestinian rights creates uh, a community just because by, by reaction to the fact that there's so many people who want to like push you away or not talk about it. When you find people who, who step up to the plate, you know, you got an immediate bond, as they said. So I really you know, like that. I was uh, speaking with a couple folks earlier and they said, you know, we're in the trenches back home doing this work. And it's not only non, it's, it's not only non appreciated, we get slings and arrows because of the work. And so to come here to a conference like this, where like you say, there's a spirit of community, you leave refreshed and renewed for the continuing struggle. Yeah. yeah. And you got new people, you know. That's right. That's right. And every year, uh, uh, the speakers are amazing, but it's also about the networking. And, yep, and not networking. just networking, but the, as you said, the camaraderie. Yeah. Well, I also, you know, you can't do this activism stuff if, if it doesn't give you some, some pleasure, some, some energy, some, uh, you know, psychic rewards. Uh, and uh, I like to use the fun word, actually. <laughs> if it's not fun, you know, <laughs> uh, then, uh, yeah, I don't know if I could last myself. You know, some people are more dutiful than I am. But uh, this, is, this is a great issue to be involved in. Um, it's fascinating. There's like a million different angles on it. From at every kind of angle, we heard and, this uh, morning, uh, energy companies, curricula, and textbooks, uh, all of them con uh, connected to the larger human rights issue. Theology. Yeah, I mean, it's theology, all interconnected. History, sociology, race, identity, politics, and more politics, foreign affairs, diplomacy, um, psychology. I mean, this is just a weird issue, and you know the way in which Israel has carved out this or had carved out for it this bizarre uh, apartheid state that is bizarrely tolerated and in fact condoned and, and supported by uh, otherwise relatively normal societies. <laughs> Let me ask you this, uh, the, uh, the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, D.C., you know, uh, uh, I mean, you're a part of that yeah, work. Yeah, Episcopalian, yeah. Yeah. Uh, recently just passed a resolution. Three resolutions. Three resolutions. Tell us about it. Well, the the big thing that's going on, and we were we were the third diocese of the Episcopal Church to pass an apartheid resolution, which simply says that Israel is an apartheid state, and uh, and that we as Episcopalians find that to be a sin. It is in in, in effect our, our resolution didn't quite get this theological, but in effect apartheid is the the ultimate sin. It's the sin that captures really the essence of what we're not supposed to do in loving our neighbors and in forgiving people and reaching out and doing God's justice and love in the world. It's like the, it's the perfect anti-God way to be, which we've done in our own country and we, we know South Africa did it. And so um, for a church, this is, this is the big one. Then, then we had also a, a, a resolution uh, uh, condemning Christian Zionism, which is very heretical, a very violent uh, uh, distortion of uh, Christian scripture, and also for the free speech right to boycott whomever. Everybody has a right to boycott, but there should not be laws that are targeted solely against boycotts on political grounds of Israel or parts of Israel-related um, companies and so on. One last question, Steve. Um, you just recently wrote a review uh, for Mondo Weiss on Brian Brown's uh, Apartheid South Africa, Apartheid Israel. <laughs> Tell us about uh, Brian Brown's book. Well, Brian is amazing because he's, uh, I believe he's past 80, but uh, I wouldn't want to take him on in any kind of debate because he is like a pistol. He's it's a tome. Hot. It's a big book. He's lived the book. It's really a book about everything that he's lived through as a South African starting in the 60s to oppose apartheid and to realize in his society, to, to, to understand the apartheid mentality which he was, you know, had been kind of indoctrinated with and then to have the experience of breaking through to like the black consciousness movement in South Africa, which was a terribly important thing for the for the Africans to like, you know, really uh, come together and understand what 
what was their responsibility and how their own understanding themselves and their place in the world is, is essential. And so uh, Brian's group, the, the uh, Christian Institute, like bonded with uh, black consciousness and, and he says an extremely exciting, uh, life affirming, identity expanding experience and then he got banned by the South African 13 government. years. So yeah, he was, he was banned under a ban for 13 years until Mandela was released. It was, it's so, it was so incredibly tough to be banned. I mean, you can't meet with anybody. I mean, one person at a time, and even then, you better be careful. So he went to Britain, and he's lived there ever since, but he immediately kept the fight going by uh, being the Africa Secretary for the British Council of Churches. Meanwhile, he had already figured out um, what was going on in Palestine was the same exact problem. So he has uh, lived this whole thing, and he can tell you the, the spirituality of apartheid, he can tell you the history of it, the, the sociology of it, kind of like apartheid from the inside. These human rights reports, you know, they, they look at the outside, they go, look, here's what's happening to Palestinians. Boom, 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 it doesn't happen. And so they, they, they've got the objective facts, prove it. He gives you all of the deeper, more human, psychological, theological, spiritual kind of elements, as well as plenty of facts, because it is, it is really like a rich book. and. Uh, I think he's the man of the hour. His book is, is the one that will show how liberal churches in this country and around the world are going to move to make the turning point from seeing a problem and, and being unhappy about it and hoping, to, hoping that maybe it'll get better and saying the right things to actually seeing it as an incredible challenge that they have to face, that we have to face as liberal Christians, true believing way Christians, and th that's our job as Christians. There's no way around it. And I think that Brian's book leads you right down the path to that reaffirmation of our most fundamental beliefs. Steve France, my friend. <laughs>So we're here at the Washington Report for Middle East Affairs Conference, and we're with our, our friend Linda Mansour. And uh, uh, I always say about Linda that she knows everybody, not only in Palestinian rights uh, circles, but also in progressive political circles. Linda, what stands out from, for you from what's happened already this morning at the conference? Name one or two things that really has been insightful for you or has touched your heart. Well, what always touches my heart is, I was just saying to you, I feel like I'm home when I come and see these committed individuals that have been here the long haul. This is not newbies that are, have just become activists. These are like committed people that do the real work. So that, for me, is always invigorating because you, sometimes you give up hope for a second, but then you remember that, no, there are people that you can hold hands with and keep going. Um, you know, I've, what I've learned today, what did I learn today? Is that your question? Um, I, I was very uh, impressed by the, um, the Virginia Coalition on Human Rights. Amazing. And, yeah, the kind of work that, yeah. and it's very And it's very de it, detailed. It, it's a detail, and, and you could actually draw a map and follow it all over the United States, in the education field, in so many fields. When, in fact, when they were talking about BDS, what came to my mind is, and, I, and I'm going to use this opportunity to share this because I, I really want people to think about this. In Ohio, I helped working on the, you know, fighting BDS, anti-BDS legislation. And we were, you know, gung-ho and there were 60, 70 of us that were either, you know, Catholic, Christian, Jewish, businessmen, professors. We were the whole gamut from the, the whole state. Um, and we were so, like, invigorated. We were so proud of ourselves. There, there were so many of us. On the other side, They'd be only one at a time, but each one was representing thousands. And, but yet, you know, it was, it was good. We were together, we did the work. When it went up for a vote, we got shot down. But what was really interesting is that one of the uh, senators asked to suspend the vote, a vote, to suspend the rules, so that they could vote on his resolution, which had no oversight. And the resolution was to change the percentage that could be invested in foreign bonds and currency and from the Ohio Treasury. And at the time, it had been one, it had gone up to one and a half, to two percent. 
Now we have in Ohio $250 million of our state treasury invested in Israeli bonds. And so when they were talking about BDS today, anti-BDS legislation, and I went and spoke to them afterwards, I told them the story. I said, did you look at that? He said, no. And I'm, I'm thinking, we need watchdog. That's right. All over, in each state we have, I mean, there, you know, he, they, what they were talking about is basically having watchdog. They suggested we go once a month, and that was interesting too, that as a group, and talk to the legislators. And, but we need to focus on where the dollar is, because that's where on the undercurrent, I think, really is. In our, in our example, we were focusing on this BDS legislation that was maybe three quarters of a page, and really had no teeth. There yeah. was no punitive piece to it. So, yeah, 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 but then in the meantime, suspend the vote, and let's, <laughs> let's put $250 million in Israeli bonds. Yeah. And the Ohio people they are starving. Gonna pay a, they weren't going to pay a price. No. If they if they had voted it so down, there was no oversight. Yeah. So that it, it you know brought to my mind that we really need you know the, the work they're doing the Ohio I mean the Virginia coalition is amazing work. That grassroots effort that's so detailed yeah. and and specific. I mean these people really are models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really impressed with the the man from Care too. I mean, uh, oh. what a what a what an energetic. I mean he, he brought dynamism to the effort and, and again attention and to detail and, 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 and not hope, giving up I mean, and the, hope that you can make a difference this guy was in their midst for 10 years and that doesn't stop us we're going to keep doing our job from columbus ohio by the way <laughs> you saw that yeah, yeah. uh well uh tell us just briefly linda your background where's your family from and i mean this has been part of your life blood this palestinian activism i mean it's part of every palestinian's life but just say a little word about yourself well, I myself was born in Walter Reed Hospital, Washington, D.C. My dad was in the U.S. Army. But um, he, he, my dad is from a town called Bira, next to Ramallah, in the West Bank. And my mom is from Lifta, the beautiful village Oh, my of God, I've been there. Yeah. Well, and the Lifta, there's the lower Lifta and upper village. So she's from the upper Lifta. Um, and, you know, we were raised from, even though my dad, my dad was a proud American. And, you know, that's why he joined the Army. In 1948, he went to school here, but he, he in, America was a, a sample, an example. And I'll tell you a little story. When, after September 11, as he was coming back from overseas, and a young man, customs or immigration person, stopped him and said, Sir, how long have you been a U.S. citizen? And he said, You know what? Before your mother, <laughs> by your father. You have no right to ask me that. You know, it was, it was like, how long do I have to prove wow. myself? So that's what I grew up in. This man that was committed to being American, to being Palestinian, but being the American that he sh we should be. Absolutely. Yeah. It's almost like Hawaita's uh, story, right? Yeah. 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 You have not only been an activist in Palestinian rights, uh, uh, the movement, but you've also been a, uh, an activist in larger progressive circles. Say a word about that. It's the same. It's human rights. It's civil rights. And, you know, and you bring it up now that this Ukraine thing is going on, and it's like, oh my God, we couldn't have asked for better marketing. But, you know, this whole white supremacist move, you think, wait a minute, so these are the ones that are up here, but there's that, that's that bias that people don't know they have has just come out of the woodwork. So for me, children, women, um, you know, African American, Hispanic, white, it's all, it's all human rights. <laughs> Linda Mansour, thank you so much. Everybody who knows you, loves you, and thank you, you. you bring—you're the one who brings energy and joie de vivre. Merci to, beaucoup. C'est ma première langue, la <laughs> To our work together. Thank, thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thanks uh -huh. so much. So I'm here at the Washington Report for Middle East Affairs Conference in Washington D.C., and I'm here with uh, Walter Hickson, Dr. Walter Hickson. Um, a scholar, activist uh, about the Israel lobby. And so, Walter, I want to ask you first uh, your reactions to Hanan Ashrawi's uh, speech this morning. What stood out for you from her talk? Well, she's such a legendary figure and uh, has been at this for so long and, of course, is right there in Palestine. So she brings a perspective that, uh, that very few people have of, of uh, decades of effort to try to find justice and peace in the region and so um, it's always great to hear her and uh, that she maintains hope 
in the face of all the struggles for as long as they've gone on is very inspirational. You kicked off the conference this morning by simply uh, asking and then answering the question, why are we here? Yeah. Walter, why are we here? <laughs> well, uh, we're here because it's a conference on the Israel lobby and despite the fact that some people don't recognize the influence of the lobby, the lobby is tremendously significant in, in the Palestine issue in the United States. So I go through its origins, its evolution, how it gained power, the tactics that it uses. In my book, uh, Architects of Repression here, I go into great depth on, on the lobby. And so I just gave an overview of that and the, really the pernicious influence of the Israel lobby, especially its domination of the Congress, is something I emphasize. So the, the domination of the Congress, Congress name, name two or three other ways that the Israel lobby influences us in Ohio and Indiana that we may not even be aware of. Well, um, it's certainly got a pervasive influence in the, in the media. And so one of the big problems is the, the, the very poor media coverage, even from prestigious publications like the New York Times. For example, the Times has yet to acknowledge that Amnesty International yeah. declared Israel an apartheid uh, state. Uh, so it influences the media, but uh, probably the most significant thing is Congress, the control of the purse springs, all the money that it gets, and much of that goes under the radar because they don't debate. There's no debate. The money's just handed out. The support is just there. The, the congressmen are all mobilized. They know they can pay a price, and you asked about tactics, so they can be targeted in the next campaign or their opponent funded if they step out of line. So with a very few exceptions, really astonishingly few exceptions, the Congress is really under control of Israel. You, uh, your prime example was Mitch McConnell. Right. Let's just say one quick word about well, Mitch, Mitch McConnell, McConnell in the pocket of the Israel Yeah, he's, he's received more uh, funding from the Israel lobby than any other politician in American history. And so I mentioned when he first won his Senate race, it was very narrow in Kentucky in 1984. And he went to the lobby and he said, what do I need to do to get you guys to back me in the future? And they said, we're nonpartisan, you vote our way and you've got it. And so uh, he, he has been a staunch supporter of Israeli apartheid and injustice in Palestine. Walter Hickson, uh, his books are necessary reading if you want to understand the Israel lobby's influence uh, in the United States. Walter, thank you very much. Thanks for all you all do uh, at home. And that's where it begins on the home front and, and it'll work its way to Washington. Thank you very much, Walter. Okay, thank you.